And uh, yeah, let's get going. So moment of uh, promotion. So right now I'm in something called the New Jersey Watershed Ambassador Program. It was established in the year 2000. Uh, and its main goal is to promote watershed stewardship through education, like presentations like this one, and direct community involvement. So there'll be um, people organize projects such as park cleanups or um, environmental stewardship trainings. So luckily for me, watershed stewardship means pretty much anything that it has to do with the environment. So I can come here and talk about things like stream assessments or wetland animals. But we're here today to talk about trails. So benefits of trails, pretty self-explanatory. Um, good places to walk, hike, bike. Uh, they're free. It's all, well, there are a lot of free trails out there. Gym membership's getting pretty expensive. Um, so benefits to the public health, they also, trails also do a good job of protecting environmental sites um, by giving a site that might not benefit the public as much, uh, multiple uses, making it more palatable for say a town or something to be willing to pay to maintain it. Um, it also connects fragmented environments, giving animals these preserved spaces, giving animals ways to move across otherwise urbanized environments. Um, transportation, uh, they do like, you can travel on trails. I know that with gas going over $4 a gallon, might be time to pull out the bike and see what trail pops out near where I'm hosted. And uh, just like they can be, trails can be used to give environmental sites multiple uses. They can also be used to give historical sites multiple uses. Um, I know that at Kittatinny Valley State Park, the rails to trails that go through there, there's a stone cut and they have a little history placard out where apparently it filled up with snow in the early 1900s and the whole town got together to dig it out. So trails are good for preserving sites like that. Um, so when you're designing a trail, you're gonna to wanna to design it to be sustainable. And there are five main principles that you wanna remember. And that is um, the trail is authorized. It's been through the various legal processes that it takes to authorize a trail. Um, you've gotten the agreement of all landowners. This can get really complicated um, when you're dealing with a mix of federal or public land, um, private property. Just in New Jersey, there's the Office of Natural Land Management, the Recreational Trail Program, the New Jersey's Trail Program, the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority. Um, so you can be dealing with a lot of pro different processes or different um, stakeholders when you're trying to plan these. Um, it needs to be well designed. That means that a professional has gotten involved. Um, it needs to have a clear purpose. Like you need to go into this um, with a principle, with a uh, target audience, um, as well as making sure that it's connected to a greater trail network, or if it's not, that it has a distinct beginning and ending. It needs to be well constructed. You need to be using the proper materials, uh, a trail that is gonna only be good, that is designed only for foot traffic is gonna look a lot different than the trail that uh, you might drive ATVs on or ride horses on. So you're gonna need to keep an eye out for that. Um, it needs to be well maintained, uh, just like everything else trails need to be looked after so it may needs to make so for it to be sustainable a group of people that know what they're doing are regularly getting out there and maintaining it uh, which is going to bring us to the last point which is for a trail to be sustainable it needs to be well supported um, 
there needs to be people that love the trail, people that are using the trail and are hopefully motivated enough to uh, go through the, become like a trail manager or do the adopt a trail process and um, are just willing to take care of it. So I know it's only been a little bit, but you might already be tired of my voice because I'm gonna be talking a whole lot after this. But I have a short video here. It's gonna talk about unauthorized. It's gonna show sort of the aftermath of unauthorized trails. Uh, it's gonna say it better than I could. Oh, is it gonna work? Hey, there we go. So hopefully you'll be able to see and hear this all right. Yeah, Ian, we can't hear the video. I'm sorry, can't hear me? We can't hear the video. Oh. At least Were you able I to can't. Hear it? <laughs> so did anyone hear any of that? Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, hmm. Well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I guess to summarize this video, a group of people, probably very nice people, they saw a place for where you could, there was a trail that would be useful. They're going to use it to mountain bike. And so they built it. Um, unfortunately, uh, they did not take into account things like the high, um, how the trail would impact the area around it. They didn't look at whose property this trail might have cut across. And so it was brought to the attention of the, the videos from the San Juan National Forest, which is Western Colorado, was, take, was brought to the attention of that park staff. And uh, they had to go out and spend a weekend uh, destroying it, covering it. With, I mean, you saw the visuals, at least, I hope. Um, so that just sort of goes into why you're going to need to get these trails authorized, uh, because if you were uh, watch, at least looking at the video, there's, you can see there's tons of people there. Um, so that's just volunteers and paid and paid park staff whose time could have been spent uh, maintaining a better trail or a, um, an authorized trail that might have needed some other maintenance work. Uh, it can affect the views of the people who own the property near where a trail might go in. Um, after experience a situation like this, a private property owner might not um, be quite so willing to authorize it a second time. So, and yeah, and it can affect the environment. So we're gonna talk a little bit more as we get into the next section, which is, oops. so the parts of the trail. So just like a road or sidewalk, um, you can break trails down into these parts. And what we're first looking at here is the trail quarter. So that's both the area you're walking in, you're gonna be walking on, as well as uh, some headroom and space to the left and right. And that's gonna be different for, depending on which trail you happen to be on, 
I know that for the Appalachian, Appalachian Trail, their trail corridor is four feet wide and eight feet tall. So when they're doing maintenance, they're making sure that uh, branches aren't sticking into that corridor, that there isn't even if it's six, seven feet off the ground, uh, that logs that have fallen into that area are rolled off. So that's the trail corridor. There's also the tread, which is the area that you walk on. And what people are going to try and do who are building these trails is they're going to try and slope it um, by about six to eight degrees downhill. And that is going to encourage water to, instead of following this trail, like it's some sort of riverbed, it's going to continue following the hill and flow off the trail, hopefully cutting down on the erosion. Um, on a flat trail that they might raise the center so it's domed like a street so that water runs off to the sides instead of pooling on the trail. And this used to be two slides, but there's not really a lot to say about it, so I combined them. Uh, if you're talking about the back slope, you're talking about the area that's uphill of the trail. And if you're talking about the fill slope, you're talking about downhill. Um, we'll discuss later, not all trails have a fill slope, but um, we'll get more into that in a minute. Um, so the edge of the outer side of the trail, I guess you'd call the part that looks out downhill, um, is called the critical edge. And it's called critical because uh, most trails fail along this edge as water uh, runs across it or down it, it'll start to wear that side away first. And it's the most exposed area. And so at about the same, on the uphill side, you have what's called the hinge point of the edge of the tread. And that's going to set your slope. That's going to set the uh, slope of the tread and will really just um, encourage water to flow across the trail and continue downhill instead of either pooling on the trail or following it, following along it, causing the middle to uh, rot out. Right. So those are the basic parts of a trail. Um, so at this point, we're going to start getting into how you, how you start to build one. So your first step is you're going to, well, your first step is that you've planned the trail and gotten it properly authorized. Um, but one, the actual feet on the ground first step is you're gonna put flags to delineate the path that the trail will follow. And you're gonna want, and most trails are either going to flag to either show the center. Uh, so there'll be an equal amount of tread on either left and right of it or the critical edge, so the farthest outside point of the trail. Um, and these photos are sort of before and after. You can see that they started with some flagging and then excavated out that trail out of that hillside. So the next part is you clear the corridor. Um, Yeah, so that's going to entail cutting out the trees and brushes that are laying onto the laying across or in the tread area. Um, yeah, clearing out bushes and other woody growth that can be sawed or cut. Um, once again, can vary differently from place to place. Uh, when you do have finished with this part, you have your cuttings. Uh, it's suggested that you do something to spread it out or hide it so that it can't be seen from the trail. Um, that's just for aesthetic reasons to maintain the sort of natural feel that good trails are supposed to instill. Um, so then you're gonna excavate it. Uh, gonna talk about that a lot when we start talking about the tools that you can use. But at this point, this is where we talk about uh, so a trail, there's two types of trails. 
when they're built. There are full bench ones, which are, well, I guess I should start. There's half bench ones. So when you're excavating out your tread, you sort of save on some work by taking the dirt that you've dug out of the hill and using it to fill in the downhill side to create a more flat surface. Or there's the full bench where you just dig out all of the uphill until you've exposed your tread. Um, so while it sounds like you'd want the half bench because it seems like it would take, because it's less work, um, in the long run, a full bench is better because when you fill out this hill, uh, water's gonna be running around uh, across it. And um, you can do as much as you want to compact the dirt, but it's still gonna be looser than the native soil. So it's gonna erode faster and you're gonna have to do more work to keep it filled in. So when it is possible, most people prefer to build the full bench trail. Because um, I like talking about digging so much, we're gonna talk about it some more. So when you're doing hand crews, uh, crews that when you're not, when you do not have access to mechanical equipment like excavators, um, a lot of crews will create what they call a trail caterpillar. Um, the first step, the uh, first part goes through and they are just, they just loosen the soil up, um, uh, breaking up rocks and roots. Then rough, rough excavation goes through with shovels and, yeah, well, shovels. And they will sort of get the rough idea of where the trail's going to go through. And then third crew comes through with um, stuff like hose and flathead shovels. And they carve out the back slope and make sure the tread is level. And then, um, then the final touches go through and they make sure everything is the way it's supposed to be. Maybe do some final touches and then tamp down the soil so it doesn't wash away really quick. So yeah, to get all of that done, you're gonna need a bunch of tools. So we're gonna go through some of the more, uh, well, we're gonna go through all of them, but some more of the exotic ones have their own slide. Um, but yeah, if you don't have access to a backhoe or an excavator, you're gonna be using these. So loppers and hand saws, you're gonna use them to get rid of the woody debris. Um, if it's bigger around than say your thumb, you're not gonna wanna use loppers and you'd wanna saw it instead. Um, bunch of different types of shovels. Each one has its own use. So you're gonna use the spade to cut up the soil so you can dig faster. And then usually use the flat shovel to make sure that your critical edge is crisp. And um, yeah, hose you use to also dig out the soil and uh, cut sod. All right. So one of the more unusual things, or at least one that I hadn't seen, was you called it's called the Pulaski, and that is just a two-headed tool. One side is a axe, and the other side is called an adz, which is just basically it's just a hoe, but it's a little sharper. And you use this to use the axe head to break up uh, tree roots and stuff, and then use the hoe head to break up the soil. Then you got your mattock. You use that to use the pick side to loosen the compact soil and pry out some of the smaller embedded rocks. And then you can use the cutter side for loosening the soil. Uh, well, use the 
the hose side for loosening the soil and you can use the ax head if you happen to find yourself with a cutter mattock for cut up roots. So I have it on fairly good authority. This is pronounced McLeod. Um, and it's basically just a thick, a thick rake. And you can use that to rake, um, sort of rake the soil level or remove duff, which is that sort of earthy uh, organic layer. It's mulchy, it's got leaves. I'm sure if you've been out in the woods, you've sometimes noticed it's like six inches before you start to hit real soil or maybe in your garden. And then that you can sort of use that flatter, um, the sharp backside to cut through roots and sod, make sure you're breaking well. Ooh. Maybe I should have made this longer. I feel like I'm flying through it. Um, so you've designed your trail, you've built your trail. Um, now it's time for maintenance. So a trail is going to need maintenance uh, annually. And it's going to start with an assessment. Excuse me. So um, this is assuming that you're working with a trail group or a land manager. And they're going to have their own outlines for what you should be looking for and what their specific requirements are. But if you're just out or you're out, you are doing an assessment, you should always mark down it, or you're just out and you see an issue, you should mark where you found it. And that's either gonna be latitude, longitude or the distance from the trailhead. And we're just gonna go through some of the more common types of maintenance that you need to do. So after every windstorm, you can be guaranteed to go out and you feel you're gonna see down tree. Well, every bad windstorm, you're gonna see down trees. Um, it's pretty, it can get pretty incredible. So when these trees fall across trails, they're gonna to need to get either, a crew's gonna either come out and roll them off the trail, or if it seems like that'll be too much trouble, they can just cut and Roll it, roll the section that was across the trail, roll it off the trail. Um, so I think the, the big thing for logging is just to make sure you manage um, your job size. Uh, if it seems like it's going to be too complex or there's not enough people, there's no shame in just saving that for another time around. The other thing, of course, we were talking about the trail corridor. So you got to manage the brush that grows in. Um, I know that if you slack off in yard work for one week in New Jersey, you're dealing with a jungle. So it's about the same. Uh, you got to reestablish the trail corridor by cutting back vegetation. Um, so the goal here is to preserve the natural feel of the trail. So when cutting back the branches, you're going to want to cut at the sort of beginning of the new growth or back where the branch meets the trunk. Um, and hold on, what's this? Oh, right. And so if you do decide you need to cut a sort of larger branch, what you're supposed to do is make a cut at the bottom first and then cut it from the top. So that way the bark doesn't tear down the trunk as you're pulling this branch off. And when you're on flat ground, you would be doing it symmetrically. But one of the ways that trail stewards can sort of encourage trail safety is they let it grow a little closer to the out the downhill section of the trail to encourage people to sort of stay closer to the inside. So point three is you want to avoid flagpoles and stops. So a flagpole is where you've pruned a tree out of the trail corridor 
and you realize that you've more or less taken off half the tree. Um, at that point, it you hopefully you would have caught something if it's a well established tree. Hopefully you would have caught something like that in planning. Um, but if you do run into that at that point, um, it's mostly advised to just take the tree out, or I guess you can or reroute the trail. But they suggest just removing the tree. And stobs are when you've pruned smaller trees. You got to make sure to cut them as close as you can to the dirt. Otherwise, you're going to be leaving these small tripping hazards. Basically, if anyone falls on them, it can be dangerous. So another big thing, probably the one of the main things that trail stewards have to deal with is trying to control erosion on the trail. So no matter how well constructed your trail is, as water's running down it, it's going to start to soil. Is, it's going the water is going to pick up soil as it runs across the trail. Uh, we were talking about slanting it to encourage that, but any of it is going to any amount is going to slowly erode the trail. So you end up with these two zones, which is if you look at this picture on the uphill side, that hinge section starts to deteriorate and leads to something called slough. Wait. Hmm. All right. Sorry. Slough. And that is going to encourage water to either run along the trail by making the hinge too shallow, or if it makes it flat enough, the water is just going to puddle there, causing people to avoid it, which is going to put more um, wear and tear on the outside edge of the path, the critical edge, which is already eroding faster. So that's when you're going to take your sort of flat-headed shovel and just carve out that back hill again. So another point is sometimes a berm will form from soil getting left as the water flows downhill. Um, larger sediment can fall out of it, creating a berm. And what's that going to do? What that's going to do is encourage water to follow the trail, to flow down it as if it was a riverbed or something. And that is eventually going to, that's going to completely change um, sort of the, hydro, the hydrological layout of this area that this trail is on, which can impact things such as how much rain a stream gets, which might cause it to dry up, at least for a little bit. So that's when you're going to take your either. Your, I believe I have some suggestions for tools. Yeah, um, you can just use a rake if it's not compacted. You can um, just drag it. You can just drag the dirt down the hillside to spread it back out. Uh, just make sure that that critical edge is nice and clean. All right, so blazing. So I might have I might have focused too much on this one. I don't know how much blazing people are going to be doing. Um, but there's bunches of different types of blazes. There's paint blazes, um, which is what I'm familiar with. There's plastic tags, which I've also seen. Um, there's cairns, which are stacks of rocks. Uh, you probably won't see a lot of those in New Jersey. But maybe if you're hiking and you're way, way out there, you might see one. Um, and just some rules for placing them. So every place is going to have their own rules. But generally, if you're going to signal a turn, you're going to want to signal it a bit beforehand. Uh, and then place a... And then place a sort of a confirming blaze a little bit after the turn so that people know that they're still on the same trail. Um, yeah. 
you want to blaze close enough to each other that from the one that you're at, you can see the next one. And you're going to want to keep them at about eye level. Uh, and on light colored bark, you're going to want to avoid putting them on rocks. If you are dealing with plastic tags, they're going to suggest using two inch nails. But you're going to want to leave a little space when you're hammering it in so that the root tree has room to grow around the nails. In I believe that if you leave it flush, it'll sort of just eventually pop the blaze off. So that just means it makes it more long lasting. And if you're using a paint blaze, uh, you want to use water based paint. All right, so I've been talking about a lot of different stuff. But throughout all of this, you're going to be, want to make sure to use safety in every part. So that can mean making sure you're dressed appropriately and using the correct PPE. So usually you're gonna to wanna to be using boots, long pants. Um, I know that we've all gotten a little too familiar with the turn PPE over the last couple of years. But in this case, we're talking about stuff like gloves, uh, safety goggles. Um, even if you don't think you're using, even if you don't think you need safety goggles, you should probably put some on. I just recently was doing an invasive species removal um, with just pruners and hand saws and somebody got whipped in the eye with a vine. So it never pays, it, it never doesn't pay to be careful. Um, but it can also mean stuff like sunscreen, making sure you have, making sure you have water with you usually if you're working outside or lunch. Um, you're going to want to discuss safety with organizers or other volunteers before you start. That can be just whose cell phone has coverage. I know things can get pretty spotty out there. Uh, who knows CPR? What the plan is if there's an accident? Um, just be aware of your surroundings. Make sure you know who's using tools and keeping away from them. Um, or just making sure that the weather is staying nice. Don't want to get caught out in a hailstorm. And just, yeah, you're going to want to be careful with your tools. Um, so for there's something called the blood bubble. Gruesome, I know. And that is the sort of bubble that's around somebody using a tool, which it's safe to approach. Like how far away you want to stay from somebody while they're swinging a tool around. And that is generally two times the length of the, the reach of the instrument. And you're just going to want to communicate. See if anything's wrong, say so. Or if you just want to talk to somebody about how good you're feeling, that's fine too. Hopefully you're having fun out there. All right. So I don't really have a good track of time and I don't have any clocks on this side, but uh, just take a couple of minutes to talk about. So I just went through all this stuff that you can do. And now it's time to find out. So what are places where you can actually get involved? Um, first big one for me is state parks. They have a volunteer form right on their website. Or if you just go in and ask them, all the park rangers are really, all the naturalists and park rangers are really nice. Um, I included a link. I don't, maybe, maybe uh, that can get dropped in the chat. I'm not sure if anyone's interested. There's volunteer.gov, which compiles volunteer opportunities statewide. They do have a trail stewardship one, a trail stewardship category. I couldn't find anything in New Jersey, but it's just one of those ones that if you're interested, you'll have to check a couple of times. Um, there's the DNR Greenway Land Trust. Uh, I've posted a blurb from their website. They also have, they are also associated with the New Jersey Trail Association, um, which is sort of a shoot off that does focus more on trail stewardship. But if you 
go on that website and try and volunteer. It'll just redirect you to the DNR Greenway. So I just looked them up. Um, and so the new, and lastly, we've got the New Jersey, New York Trail Conference. Um, they are probably one of the largest sort of people, organizations involved in trail stewardship. Um, they have an AmeriCorps program that you can volunteer for. Uh, they have day trips. They just are constantly posting volunteer opportunities. Um, so yeah, I am done. Are there any questions? Was that half an hour? Was that 15 minutes? You were at 38 minutes. All right. <laughs> Yeah, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, you may get easy off. <laughs>